I'm moving my microphone right over here so that I actually sound correct. You can tell how prepared I am for my stream. So here we go. Hopefully the mic volume and everything is pretty solid there. But yeah, so today, let's see here. It was weird. We talked about butterfly dying unlike love. About a butterfly dying unlike love. Interesting. Poetry is abstract in that way. I don't quite follow what you're saying there, Panda, but I'm sure in context it makes a lot of sense. But getting back to what I was saying, life is tough right now, and it's exacerbated by the fact that we have all this extra time. And so I wanted to get on and read you guys some poetry and read you guys some stories, and hopefully maybe you can listen to this when you're going to bed or when you've you're in the car or you find yourself with just an abundance of free time and you need something to do but you don't want to sit down and read a book yourself so you'd rather listen to me drone on and on and talk about a book so the way that this is going to work or the way that i have this planned out and again i'm always open to suggestions but i thought that when i am reading i will actually read through the book and or whatever passage that i'm reading and then i don't really want to stop like we're going to be drop, jumping into some poetry here in a second. So what I'll do is I'll read a poem and then I'll kind of do a reflection or give my opinion on it. And then after that, I'll check on chat and everything like that. But I'm not really going to be looking at chat while I'm reading. So you just kind of have to wait for those breaks in between. And I will also preface this by saying that I'm not like a literary analyst. I'm not an English person by any stretch of the imagination. There are probably oh, so many other people that are rightfully academically qualified to analyze these books using pragmatic approaches that are well vetted and stuff like that but i just think some of the books are cool so i just want to read them and then give them my take and if you use my citations or you use my ideas for like an essay or something like that that's totally free to do that by the way you can use my critique if you want for the purposes of a like an essay or something like that but just realize that I'm kind of a layman when it comes to these things. I don't have a degree in English. So some of my insights might not be as groundbreaking as if you were to read somebody who's studied these authors or studied these stories extensively. So with that in mind, let's talk about our first book and our first author. So as you can see, right over here, everything's reversed. Right over here, we're gonna be crouching into this book, The Prophet by Cahill Gilbron. And I'll give you guys a little bit of an insight. So I want to do these like introductions before I start reading all of my stories. So Pika, or sorry, Pika, Panda said that you should meet Mr. Yasko. Hmm. Is he like a streamer or something like that? Does he do reading and literature and stuff like that? He sounds like a nice guy. I'll have to check him out. But yeah, so Cahill Gabron. Cahill Gabron was a... Lebanese American author. His full name is Gibran Cahill Gibran, so it's kind of a repeat. His first name and last name are the exact same, but he went by Cahill when growing when he was growing up, or Khalil, I should say. I always say Cahill, but it's actually Khalil. There's a second L in there. So Khalil Gibran, and he is a like I said, a Lebanese American poet, visual artist, and philosopher. Although he kind of rebuked the title of philosopher later down the road. Mr. Yasko is your high school literature teacher. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I, I have a special place in my heart for literature teachers. They, uh, they do a lot of interesting stuff and they help inspire the young generations to read, which is an important thing. You guys should read every day. So getting back to it. So our good buddy Khalil, he was born on January 6th, 1883, and then he died on April 10th, 1931. And he was aged 48 when he died. He is most known for his works of poetry, including The Three Ants, The Broken Wings, and his most popular work, The Prophet, which is what we're going to be reading today. So a little bit more on that book. The Prophet is a book of 26 poems. It has been translated into 100 languages, making it one of the most translated books in history. And it follows the prophet Al-Mustafa as he's leaving the city of Orphalace. Orphalace is, I guess, a, I, can't, I didn't get a chance to research it, but I think it's a city in kind of the area of Lebanon and that sort of area, but I'll have to look it up later. And he's lived there for 12 years and he's about to hop on a boat and leave Ophelis to go back to his homeland. But before he goes, these people track him down 
And I guess he was like a, a local prophet or a local philosopher and they see him going and they're like, wait, 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 we have a couple things that we want to ask you about before you go. And so the 26 poems of the prophet are his response to what the people ask him. So you'll hear the people in this book. I haven't read all the poems. Well, I think I'm sure I've read them all at one point, but I haven't read them contiguously at one time. So this will be kind of going through the poems one by one for me and for you guys as well. But when, it, when you read the poems, there's going to be at the start, they'll usually say, and then the people asked him dot, dot, dot. And then it's the prophet's response. So that's kind of how this is structured. And one thing that I immediately notice, I don't know if he did this intentionally, Gibran, I mean, but these stories or this kind of call and response is very sort of biblical in nature. It sounds a lot like Jesus talking. So I don't know if there's supposed to be a parallel between Jesus and the prophet Al Mustafa, but um, that's just one thing that I saw. And again, I think that a lot of these styles of literature kind of mimic that biblical sort of prose where Jesus is teaching and that sort of thing. But that's just one thing that I think about with this book. So let me catch up on chat here really quickly. He's so cool. He gives off so many dad vibes and he loves poems and you guys get along. Well, that sounds great. He sounds like a really nice dude. I, I dig that. And, uh, Poetry is important. I have a collection of poetry books somewhere. I like American poetry, so I like a lot of Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, those sort of things. But I have, I literally have three po poetry books right next to them. I have the works of Edgar Allan Poe, the works of Walt Whitman, and then the works of Lord Byron. So those are my top three. So Edgar Allan Poe, Walt Whitman, and Lord Byron, which he had an actual name, not Lord Byron, but I can't remember what his name is off the top of my head. He's told you so many funny stories. I love that. I love when teachers can kind of joke around with their students and all that good stuff. Because a lot of people think of teachers as like these intimidating folks, but teachers are people just like you. So I like when they're kind of a little bit more fun and outgoing. So without further ado, let's crack into this. This is The Prophet by Cahill Gibran. Oh, wait, I have one more thing to say before we jump into it. So just kidding. This is actually one of my grandma's favorite books. So she had this book memorized at some point and she would go to bars and like recite poetry on the piano or these are the stories that she tells me so she would go to bars and like recite poetry on the piano or wherever they are and she would recite like Cahill Gibran and other poets and apparently that's how she picked up guys back in the day so as you know the mad lad lineage starts strong with my grandma and down through to me and so, like I said, I'm going to be reading each of these poems sequentially, or I'm going to be reading the book sequentially. And after each poem, I'm going to do kind of a reaction and give you my input on all this sort of stuff. And as we're going along, definitely in chat, if you're interested, or if you feel something that's like really fire, or, you know, Gibran is dropping bars, definitely let me know in the, in the chat and we can talk about it. So without further ado, here is The Prophet by Cahill Gibran. Let's see here. I don't know where the publication page is for this. Uh, this power came, shh, the books of kill. Oh, this is the books. Oh, here we go. So in case you didn't know, every book has at the beginning a publication page. That's this one right here. And it'll tell you when the book was first published, its ISBN number, if it has one. And sometimes, especially for American printings, they will have the Library of Congress reference number. So if you go to the Library of Congress, you can look it up. And then you can tell when it was first published and then the current edition, and then who published it originally and who published it currently. So this first was published in November 1926, and it was reprinted 13 times. This is the 15th printing, so 15th edition from November of 1971. So this book is older than I am by like 23 years. I was born in 94, 94 minus 23, yep, 71. So yeah, and this is a Barozzi book. So Barozzi book published by Alfred A. Knopp Incorporated. I, I was reading, I was doing some research, uh, Barozzi, I don't know if they're a publisher, or if that's like a style of writing, I'll have to look that up. And then, it was manufactured in the United States of America. So that's the publication page. So now let's get into this. I'm gonna set a little bit of ambiance here. So remember, Al Mustafa is at a harbor and he's about to get onto a boat and the people stop him. So take a second, kind of close your eyes, center your mind, 
and pretend you're just on the the dock of a harbor and you're with a crowd of people you may hear some murmuring and some talking maybe you came with a friend or your family to see this prophet and see him off maybe you're talking to them think about what you're talking about maybe some of the curiosities of what he's about to say and i'm going to set some ambiance here i'm going to play a little track here so that we can get into the mood This is The Prophet by Cahill Gobron. Al-Mustafa, the chosen and beloved, who is a dawn unto his own day, had waited twelve years in the city of Orphalese for his ship that was to return and bear him back to the isle of his birth. And in the twelfth year, on the seventh day of Yule, the month of reaping, he climbed the hill without the city walls and looked seaward and he beheld his ship coming with the mist. Then the gates of his heart were flung open, and his joy flew far over the sea, and he closed his eyes and prayed in the silence of his soul. But as he descended the hill, a sadness came upon him, and he thought in his heart, How shall I go in peace and without sorrow? Nay, not without a wound in the spirit shall I leave this city. Long were the days of pain I have spent within its walls. And long were the nights of aloneness. And who can depart from his pain and his aloneness without regret? Too many fragments of the spirit have I scattered in these streets. And too many are the children of my longing that walk naked among these hills. And I cannot withdraw from them without a burden and an ache. It is not a garment I cast off this day, but a skin that I tear with my own hands. Nor is it a thought I leave behind me but a heart made sweet with hunger and with thirst. Yet I can tarry no longer. The sea that calls all things unto her calls me, and I must embark. For to stay, though the hours burn in the night, is to freeze and crystallize and be bound in a mold. Fain would I take with me all that is here, but how shall I? A voice cannot carry the tongue, and the lips gave it wings. Alone must it seek the ether, and alone and without his nest shall the eagle fly across the sun. Now, when he reached the foot of the hill, he turned again towards the sea, and he saw a ship approaching the harbor, and upon her prow the mariners, the men of his own land. And his soul cried out to them, and he said, Sons of my ancient mother, you riders of the tides, how often have you sailed in my dreams? And now you come in my awakening, which is my deeper dream. Ready I am to go, and my eagerness with sails full set awaits the wind. Only another breath will I breathe in this still air, only another loving look cast backward. And then I shall stand among you, a seafarer among seafarers. And you, vast sea, sleepless mother, who alone are peace and freedom to the river and the stream, only another winding will this stream make. Only another murmur in the glade, and then I shall come to you, a boundless drop in a boundless ocean. And as he walked, he saw from afar men and women leaving their fields and their vineyards and hastening towards the city gates. And he heard their voices calling his name and shouting from field to field, telling one another of the coming of his ship. And he said to himself, Shall the day of parting be the day of gathering? And shall it be said that my eve was in the truth of my dawn? And what shall I give unto him who has left his plow in mid-furrow, or to him who has stopped the wheel of his winepress? Shall my heart become a tree heavy laden with fruit I may gather and given unto them? And shall my desires flow like a fountain that I may fill their cups? Am I to harp the hand of the mighty that may touch me, or a flute that his breath may pass through me? A seeker of silences am I, and what treasure have I found in silences that I may dispense with confidence? If this is my day of harvest, in what fields have I sown the seed, and in what unremembered seasons? If this indeed be the hour in which I lift up my lantern, it is not my flame that shall burn therein. Empty and dark shall rise my lantern, and the guardian of the night shall fill it with oil, and he shall light it also. These things he said in words, 
But much in his heart remained unsaid, for he himself could not speak his deeper secret. And when he entered into the city, all the people came to meet him, and they were crying out to him with one voice. And the elders of the city stood forth and said, Go not yet away from us. A noontide have you been in our twilight, and your youth has given us dreams to dream. No stranger are you among us, nor a guest, but our son and our dearly beloved. Suffer not yet our eyes to hunger for your face. Then the priest and the priestesses said unto him, Let not the waves of the sea separate us now, and the years you have spent in our midst become a memory. You have walked among us a spirit, and your shadow has been a light unto our faces. Much have we loved you, but speechless was our love, and with veils has it yet been veiled. Yet now it cries aloud unto you, and would stand revealed before you. And never has it been that the love knows not its own depth until the hour of separation. And others came also and entreated him, but he answered them not. He only bent his head, and those who stood near saw his tear falling upon his breast. And he and the people all proceeded towards the great square before the temple. And there came out of the sanctuary a woman whose name was Almitra, and she was a seeress. And he looked upon her with exceeding tenderness, for it was she who had first sought and believed in him when he had been but a day in their city. And she hailed to him, saying, Prophet of God, in quest of the uttermost, long have you searched the distances for your ship, and now your ship has come, and you must needs go. Deep is your longing for the land of your memories, and the dwelling place of your greater desires, and our love would not bind you, nor what our needs hold you. Yet this we ask ere you leave us, that you speak to us and give us your truth, and we will give it unto our children, and they unto their children and it shall not perish. In your aloneness you have watched with our days, and in your wakefulness you have listened to the weeping and the laughter of our sleep. Now, therefore, disclose us to ourselves, and tell us what has been shown to you, of which is between birth and death. And he answered, People of Orphalese, of what can I speak save what is even now moving within your souls? Then said Alamitra, Speaker, speak to us of love. Okay, so now we're getting into the poems. Perfect. So that's the first section. So here we see Almafasa. As we said, we're establishing everything. He's about to leave on the boat, and he's a little bit sad. He's sad that he's leaving this place that he's been here for twelve years, and no doubt. I mean, you spend anywhere, you spend any time anywhere for twelve years, and you kind of get attached to it in some way, and. Here he is. Clearly, he's made an impact on these people. He, people have come to him and they said that he's been a light unto their path and everything like that. Let me read back here. You have walked among us in spirit and your shadow has been a light upon our faces. That is, to me, seems like a biblical illusion because there's a psalm in the book of Psalms. I can't remember exactly which one, but it says, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto my path. So it's interesting that they use the the light analogy here or Gabran is using the light analogy here as it was used in the Bible. So that's one parallel that I've drawn as well. But here we can see a very kind of intense emotional recounting of the feeling of loneliness that the prophet Al Mustafa is feeling because he's about to leave and clearly he's distraught. And so he's going to humor these people one more time as they ask him questions about the things that he's wanting to talk about or what they want to know from him as they said people of Orphalese of which can I speak or sorry now therefore disclose us to ourselves and tell us what that has been shown of you which is between birth and death so all the things that he's experienced in life tell us more about that and in that way it's kind of like a eulogy too it seems like maybe the boat is kind of a metaphor for the prophet leaving maybe he's not leaving to the land of his home maybe he's actually dying or passing on and the people have come to view him or hear his last words so we'll never know but the the analogy or the similarity between the boat and kind of you dying is a very strong one i would say 